All right, you have, I gave you the, uh, I say I, someone passed out to you this morning your notes, uh, which is primarily just the readings of John 3, Numbers 21, and Acts 10. And I want to use those this morning to make a couple points on our text this morning. This morning is Trinity Sunday. I really preached a Trinity Sunday message last Sunday. So if you were saying, I really was hoping he talked more about the Trinity explicitly in that doctrine, you can go to last week and you will find that I preached on that last week um, in the doctrine of co-inherence. And uh, it's funny, we had Carter come and say the words in Greek and in Hebrew, but apparently he didn't have, because he didn't have the mic, Susie said a lot of people couldn't hear him anyway. But anyway, uh, I guess better not hearing than having me say him incorrectly. So, all right, let's look this morning. Implicitly in this text, we see God the Father, we see Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and, uh, but I want to make some comments. This morning is kind of a, a real teaching. I want to kind of clarify three or four things in this text this morning and, uh, uh, and then pray uh, specifically. We're going to close with the idea of what it means to believe in Jesus uh, and to be saved, and we're going to end there. So John chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus does not show himself to be the brightest theologian in our passage this morning. He really seems to be confused about a few things. But I'll tell you what he doesn't get confused about is the purpose of the power of God. I mean, we can be some caught up and say, we know you do signs, so we're really interested. But he says, we know that the signs tell us what's really important, and that is that God is with you. Do you see the difference? Remember we told you we were in India, and we saw people getting healed, and we called back and said, are they talking about the miracles? And the pastor wasn't trying to rebuke me, but he did. He said, no, they're talking about Jesus. But I was so shocked at the miracles. I'm like, they got every time. He's like, well, they all know the miracles happen. But, but they got what the most important thing is that Jesus was doing the miracles. Being a Westerner, I was so surprised that Jesus did those kind of miracles. I just didn't know that he could heal people of polio and stuff. So to see it uh, was so mind-bending that I got hung up there. But, but the Hindu and the Muslims, they got it. It's all about that Jesus was there. And, and they didn't miss it. And... Uh, uh, I'll never forget that, and I, I, I repented of my heart that was so focused on the signs. I mean, the signs are wonderful as long as they're pointing us to Jesus and we continue on to Jesus. So Jesus answered him, and what he was really, this God is with you, he's really talking about the kingdom and, and, and the presence of God. And so Jesus is telling him about the presence and what it means to be with God. And so Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You, you miss all that, he's saying, if you're not born from above. In Greek, it can say born again or born from above. And both things are true. Uh, it, without the divine uh, rebirth, which is, happens by the agency of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, without that, we miss so much about what it, what it means. All the crucial things about salvation and a life with Christ, if we don't know him, we're going to miss them. And so he says, hey, uh, unless someone's born again, born from above, uh, it, it, it won't be enough. You'll, you'll miss all that. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people disagree. What is he talking about here, water of the Spirit? I think in some ways the natural reading is to say that water is referring to the first birth, the natural birth, and then a spiritual birth. The church has always taught, I say always, the large majority of the church has seen in this baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, I think in the natural reading, because of what he's saying about born the flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit, he is referring that water is most likely talking about when we're born the water breaks, talking about the first birth, natural birth, and then a spiritual birth. But I want to mention to you something, and for whatever reason, it's a small diversion, but not too small, 
because as I was preparing this week, this kept coming back to me, and I felt like I was supposed to make this clear. And that is, I want you to notice, turn the page or whatever in your notes, and notice that passage in Acts chapter 10. I, I have some, uh, I have a friend uh, who was a professor and used to be my pastor. He's a professor at Wheaton College, and he comes kind of from the Quaker side of things, the evangelical Quaker side of things. And he's a born-again guy, but he doesn't believe in water baptism. And we've had a guy in Gainesville who wrote a book, who was a pastor, assistant pastor at a large church, and and he wrote this book and said, uh, you shouldn't water baptize, that's not uh, for today. Uh, And and that's, of course, it's an error, it's wrong. Uh, And and so I just want to say, because of our congregation and this city, I want to just mention this, and I want you to notice that while it is crucial that we're not only water baptized, but also baptized in the Spirit, it is not enough to be baptized in the Spirit and not water baptized. All right, now, where do we prove that? Well, there's about five or six places, but here's one of the beautiful and obvious places. Notice Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 44. There's a whole section there about Cornelius coming to Christ and him speaking in tongues as the Spirit comes upon him. But anyway, let's notice verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, he was talking about Jesus and salvation, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Oh my goodness, they were surprised. Remember, Peter wouldn't even go into a Gentile house. He was in Cornelius the Gentile's house. And the idea was if you go into a Gentile's house, you might be eating their food and you might be doing something unclean. And so they were prohibited from their traditions not to even enter into a Gentile house. So he had never been in a Gentile's house before. Not only is he in a Gentile's house, as he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls, and boy, were they shocked. They couldn't even imagine that God would deal with those people until they got circumcised and they become Jews, okay? So here's where they find out, oh, they don't have to become Jews to get to Jesus. So, and verse 45, and those of the circumcision, or the Jews, uh, who believed were astonished Oh my gosh, we we never thought. Let me tell you something. When those Hindus and Muslims in India said they want to get saved, we thought they don't really understand. Let's be honest. We thought they got all those idols. This is going to take a long time for them to get it. But you know what kind of gave it away that they were getting it? The Holy Spirit started falling. And when the Holy Spirit falls, one thing about it, you say, well, I don't know how this works, but I can tell you what, the Holy Spirit's here and he's moving on them. Uh, And that really surprised us. I know what it means to be astonished. They really were, somehow the Holy Spirit revealed to them the personal work of Jesus far more than I could expect and far quicker than I could expect. And I don't mean they didn't need to be grown and discipled and taught. They Surely they did. And the local pastors followed up. But I tell you what, when the Holy Spirit starts falling, uh, if it's good enough for the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's good enough for for me or you, right? All right, that's, that's, the, that's the logic, all right? And those of the circumcision who believed, they were astonished that pagans could come right and the Holy Spirit would come upon them. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. I mean, these people started speaking with tongues. They're like, wow, that's what happened to us at Pentecost. They must have got it. And, and they were right. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water? Now, you might say, wait a minute. Water is just the symbol. It's just the sign. It's all about the new birth and the Holy Spirit. So if they have the Holy Spirit, why waste our time and go back and water baptize? But Peter says, though they have what the baptism symbolizes, new life, uh, it is foundation upon that that we go back and water baptize. We don't skip the sacrament even though what the sacrament is pointing to and symbolizing, even though those things uh, have already happened, we're going to go back and we're going to use the sacrament as well. Because in the sacrament, they're also incorporated into Christ and receive a new nature. But the Spirit had fallen upon them. So, by the way, this also shows us that they were aware that there is two bapt- Water baptism is not the same as spirit baptism. That's something you also can tell from here. All right, and the answer isn't to have one without the other. The other thing we can see is we need both. We need water baptism and spirit baptism. Now, I'm a little jealous because I have been with some people. When they got saved and baptized, they got filled with the Holy Spirit at the same, almost instant when they got baptized. And some I've even seen when they got saved. It's amazing. For me, it took years. 
to surrender myself and to be open to the Holy Spirit in that way. Now, partly because I was raised in churches that told me, don't open yourself to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because they thought it was uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, they thought it was unnecessary. Uh, not true. Okay, so one of our conclusions, let's get to one of the conclusions. Hey, have you been water baptized? Let's make sure if you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you believe him. Let's make sure that you follow through in obedience and you've been baptized in water. But if you've been baptized in water and you believe in Jesus, make sure you don't stop there. Make sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit too. All right? That's, that's, that's some of the inferences that we can go. So there's a couple uh, early conclusions from our text this morning. Now, going back. So then Jesus explains the logic of this, of not going back in the womb, but being born. He says, verse five, most assuredly I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. We need something else greater than flesh, and that's the spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Seven, don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. You see, what was Nicodemus' problem? Nicodemus' problem was, was he couldn't figure it out. Jesus, don't marvel and be all astonished thinking about this because you can't figure it out. There are many things that you believe in that you can't figure it out. He says, by the way, you know Nicodemus, when the wind blows, you don't know where, when it's going to come, you don't know which way it's going to come from, and you don't know which way it's going to go. But when it comes, you believe in it. Do you know, I have been with people who told me, well, I can't understand that. Hey, if I had to understand everything to believe it and to live with it, I couldn't drive a car. I've seen the little YouTube things on how an engine works. I am just as clueless now. I mean, I don't understand math. I would never be able to use any calculus. I wouldn't be able to use algebra. I mean, think of all the things that if I had to understand it all, that I would miss. And there, I just learned some point in time, I am not the end all and be all. That there are many, many things far beyond me. Do you know how amazed I am that someone could shoot a little firecracker in the air or come up with gunpowder? How someone ever figure that out? Let alone send someone to the moon. I mean, that's so, we wouldn't even have a wheel if it was up to me. <laughs> you know, we would be the dark, I don't know how these people made, how did people figure out calculus and uh, airplane, how does an airplane work? I don't know, by sitting in it all the time. Oh, the wind under here, this crazy lift by this, and I'm clueless. See, Nicodemus, don't get all stuck that you can't understand the whole thing. You understand the wind, Nicodemus. It comes whichever way it wants to, when it wants to, and when it does, you're able to feel it and sense it. You can't tell where it's all going. You don't understand the whole thing. You can apprehend or understand in part, even if you cannot understand the whole thing. Don't be one of these people that says, in essence, I'm like God. If I don't understand it, it's not real. Your understanding, your ways are not God's ways. It's much bigger, just like it's much bigger than my ways. And the things that are true are in his word, and we believe those things, though we do not completely and fully understand them all. I don't understand it all. I think, well, why did you take so long to, to teach me this and that? I, I mean, imagine the answer is because you were sinful and difficult, but I mean, there's, there's all kind of obvious, I don't know what the answer is. I can think of some, but I don't know. But I'm so grateful for his love and his goodness to me and his truth, which is far beyond my comprehension. Remember, to comprehend is to understand the whole. I comprehend very little. I have apprehend or hold on in part to many things. And all that I need and must have has been given to me in the scriptures. Everything which I have to have, I have. God's given it to me in his word. But there is far, far more for me. And, and for all eternity, we will be learning and growing uh, without end, as we are in the presence of God. So, don't marvel that I said, don't get all hung up on this like you had to understand everything. And I, I have a really good dad, and I have a dad who sometimes, one time my father said to me, and I've heard people say this about the Pentecostals, he said, oh, why would God send gold dust? Why would God give someone a gold filling? Maybe you've never heard this, but in Pentecostal meetings, people claim these things. Let me tell you something, I made fun of it, and I went to a meeting, and I saw both. And I, I learned something. Just because I may think it's silly and stupid, <laughs> I gotta say stupid, sorry, Lord, uh, doesn't mean it ain't happening. I mean, I'm not saying it always happens, but I've seen it. I took students from Santa Fe when I was a professor, went to a revival, and I made fun of the guy because he was on TV, 
in Jacksonville, I saw, I don't ever watch local news. I was watching Jacksonville news and I heard of this guy and I said, look, you got to do this assignment for the class. I'll give you extra credit. We'll all go together. And, and I was taking non-Christian students. I said, we'll all go and we'll all see this guy. He was, he was, he was ministering at Kanapa Hall Middle, Middle School. I'll never forget it. And I mean, I have no idea why, but I tell you what, the Lord manifested himself. And I want you to know, this is something I want you to always remember. The question is not, why does God do what God does? We may never understand why. The question is, is it God? Is it the flesh or is it the devil? That's the important question. There are many things I have now seen that I do not know why. But I have been able to discern the spirit and know it is God who is doing it and not the devil. That's the key. Not you got to understand it all. The question is, what is the source? Meaning, you may have no good reason in your mind. I was saying about my dad. My dad's a great guy. He said, but why would God do this? I said, Dad, it's not. The question is not. Try to be respectful, but I rebuked him in this sense. Rebuke is to correct and say, wait a minute, Dad. We may not know a lot of things why, but the question is, is it God? That's the question I want you to remember. Is it God? It could be supernatural and the devil. Just because it's supernatural, it could be fake. It could be the flesh. It could be the devil, or it could be God. All right, we want to, Lord, is it you? That's the question. Because if it's God, let me tell you something, it's good for you. If it's God. Okay? So once you ascertain that, then you may or may not understand the rest of it. All right, so Jesus answers him, tells him about the wind to help him understand that he does not have to understand everything to benefit from it. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Verse 9. Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher of Israel? You got the Old Testament. All this stuff is in there. You don't know it? Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak that we know and testify that what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Now remember, in the early days of Jesus' ministry, people understood him to be a disciple of John the Baptist. He is probably speaking about him and John the Baptist. Until after this, in John the Baptist, right at the end of chapter 3, he goes in, the, the John goes back in to talking about John the Baptist. So he's probably referring to the things that were taught by John the Baptist as well as himself. But in either case, he says, if we have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? All right? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Remember, every communion service, we lift up the bread and the, and the wine, saying, Jesus, you ascend it. Now, Father, pour out your spirit. Not only in the bread and wine, which we're asking him to do, but in all of us, that when we participate together in this holy meal, that you would pour out your spirit in us and through us. Okay, it is absolutely Pentecost. We are praying for a present Pentecost in every communion service. Okay, so when you see the chalice and the bread go up, you know, we're saying, Father, Jesus has ascended. And what's the Father's part when Jesus ascends? But to pour out the Spirit who descends. So that it would be better for us that Jesus send it. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm raising that. We're not just up there doing this. I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, you ascend it. Now, Father, you know your part. Pour out your Spirit. Profoundly, richly, right here and right now. My Catholic friends... Sometimes they think when the Holy Spirit's poured out, it's only in the bread and the wine. My Pentecostal friend thinks, we don't need the bread and wine. We just want the Holy Spirit. The truth is, I'm asking for both. I want a holy, that Jesus described as a holy meal where he feeds us with himself by the power of the Spirit. That we're strengthened and we're, we're growing, just like we pray in confirmation. That day by day, we'll increase in the knowledge and love and obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day. Communion being one of those meals, those heavenly spirit Pentecost meals that would feed us to that end. All right. No one has ascended, verse 13. We're almost over. Well, at least the text is almost up. The, te the text is almost done. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven, 14. Now here's a, here's a one right here. And as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, you have there in your notes, Numbers 21. I think that would be on the back, at the bottom. And it says, the bronze serpent, coming from my New King James Bible uh, paraphrase of the section. Now, 
Some of you remember, what was the sin that was going on that caused God to judge the Israelites with poisonous snakes? This is scare you. For those of you who like to be kind of whiners and complainers, they were grumbling. They were whining and complaining. For those of us like me who are whiners, we ought to think about this a little bit. Okay, God had taken really good care of them, but yet what they were doing, they're always complaining about what they wanted as if God had not been faithful in the past, as if he might forget them tomorrow, even though he had showed them over and over and over again. It's one thing when we're baby Christians. But you know, for some of us, and I'm speaking to me as much as anybody that I have ever met even, it is amazing how good God has been to me and yet how frustrated sometimes I get about the part that hasn't happened yet. Even though God has been so faithful and so good to me. So God punished him with poison. Now, these were poisonous snakes. But apparently, to make snake bite to me is about one of the most horrific things you could think of. That's just, my, my dad was, was a bit of a, by a copperhead when he was five. And uh, he had these hallucinogenic dreams and he almost died. He was in West Virginia about 1955. Uh, no, it would have been earlier than that. It would have been uh, 46. And uh, they only had one car in the whole neighborhood in West Virginia where he was, and the guy had just rebuilt his transmission. And the doctor said, if you had been five more minutes, you would have been dead. So the one car in this mountain, it had just been put back together by God's grace and providence. The guy was able to come get him when they got a hold of him, came, got my father. He said he, used to have, he said he had these dreams, and he said it was like being in green peanut butter. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Yeah. I've always tried to stay out of the hallucinogenic green putter, peanut butter snake bit dreams. I've, he put a big impression on me, my father. And, 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 so, uh, and so I just can't imagine. But when this snake bit you, apparently it took a little time. And so God says to Moses, hey, you put up a bronze serpent on a pole. And if the people will look as a sign of the repentance and faith, if they'll look and see the serpent, I'll heal them and I'll deliver them from this poison and they will live. By the way, in the context, it appears that some did and some did not. Meaning it's not clear from the text that they all did. It's just the ones who did were imagined people who were so rebellious that they would even refuse to look at the remedy. Are there people like that today who know Jesus God, but they refuse? Yes, I met them. Who say, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I know people say, I don't believe Jesus God. But I know people who say, I believe Jesus God, I believe, and I still will not follow him. I've met people like that. Now, the Ten Commandments forbid making graven images. Do you remember that? Well, the bronze snake was a graven image. So you might ask yourself the question, why would God tell them to do something that was forbidden? Well, because the commandment against graven images is not only a command against graven images, it was against graven images because they were prone to worship the graven image. And in fact... Later on, hundreds of years later, under Kent, King Hezekiah, he ended up killing. They kept this bronze serpent and, and the pole in the, the tabernacle, in the temple. But because under the time of King Hezekiah, it's like 2 Kings 18, uh, the people were worshiping it as like an idol, he destroyed it. King Hezekiah destroyed this thing. Now, I think even that's kind of amazing. Because I'm thinking, if God told Moses to make it, I'm not sure I'd want to be the one, even if people were misusing it. But anyway... I don't know if it was right or wrong, but I can tell you this, Hezekiah did eventually destroy it. So, so that's the reason why, why you know, if, if you have a teddy bear in your house, in essence, that would have been forbidden. Do you realize that? A picture of Jesus, a, 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 a picture of a gorilla, or if you had a dolphin, or all graven images, statues, any kind of, all those would be forbidden if we did not understand that the Ten Commandments is not merely, or not only forbidding a graven image, but a graven image in the context of worship and a religious activity. That's why we have, many of us would have a picture in our house or even a picture of ourselves. What if, if the Ten Commandments meant that no graven image, to have a wedding picture would be a sin, okay? Because it would be an, an image in that way. So that's just want you to think through the logic. The church has decided in history that in fact, that we can worship in spirit and truth and that we can have images that are not graven in the context that we would necessarily worshiping, worship those things, that's why we have those things. Uh, and, and we don't think anything of it. Isn't that amazing? We think nothing of it. There are certain groups that would still not have them.
But anyway, the question my good Calvinist friends would say is, why would you ever have a, a graven image of Jesus? Why would you have a picture of Jesus? And, and so in some groups, they won't even have a Sunday school book with a picture of Jesus because they don't want to violate the Ten Commandments. Now, I would have a picture of Jesus, potentially. I mean, we've, we certainly had curriculums and things. Why would I see that differently? And why would people see it differently and say, it's okay to have a picture of Jesus, even though we know whatever picture we have, that's not what Jesus looked like. I mean, first of all, he was Mediterranean. So he was not African, but he was certainly not Caucasian. I, I rarely see one of which the, the Jesus is very clearly uh, Middle Eastern, uh, of which he would have been. Uh, would have been. He is. Uh, so uh, he certainly didn't have any long hair. He certainly didn't look effeminate. Uh, I never liked the effeminate Jesuses. Uh, the Reformation ones to me uh, are Renaissance ones. I particularly find it doesn't, he looks like, a, you know, he's a weak kind of sweet guy without any masculinity. He certainly would have not looked that. In fact, he wouldn't have been attracted. The Bible tells us he had no physical attractiveness. We would see him and we wouldn't really notice him. It's not that he was ugly or something, just he had nothing that would be remarkable you know, there's people who we might say are nondescript. Jesus was such a way he was nondescript. There was, except for when you got to know him and the Spirit of God, there was nothing remarkable in his appearance. Um, that's just what the Bible says. But in any case, the reason that we might have a crucifix or that we might have a picture of Jesus is this. God has revealed himself in Christ, meaning once God did it, it was okay. If God had not revealed himself as Jesus, as a human being, it would be wrong to have a picture or a crucifix of Jesus. But since God has revealed himself as a human being, we can depict him in humanity, in human form, because God has done it, all right? God has the right to interpret himself in that way and to say, therefore, it's okay. And God did that in Jesus, in his life, and his death on the cross. I, pray for me, I, don't, I, I can drink this and for whatever reason, it's in every sermon. Until my sermon's over, I get this. It sounds like I'm a smoker. I like that. I like to smoke cigars, but I've not been smoking. Okay. So, now, the last thing I want to talk about today is the nature of belief. And if you would turn in the back of your sheet, there is a quotation there from a guy named Farley I've given you the footnote at the bottom, and I want to read that to you. And the reason is because it's so excellent. If there's a weakness in my background and in my spirituality that I have not done well, I mean, there's many, I'm sure, but one that I'm a parent of in terms of theology, it would be a little bit what this guy's trying to correct. See, we were so afraid not to teach that you could be saved by your works that in many cases and times, I think that we gave the impression, and I've given the impression, that belief is all about faith as an intellectual as opposed to a following. And this guy is going to make the distinction here between what it means, what the New Testament and what Jesus meant by having faith in him versus with those who would be, let's say, more afraid to say there's any works that follow. Meaning, to believe in Jesus, no work can save us. But the kind of belief that Jesus is calling us to is a faith that understands that he died for us, he gave his life for ours, and therefore it is incumbent upon us to live our life for him of surrender, a life of surrender. All right? So let's read the quote here, and then we'll close. The word believe, pisteuo, not sure I got that right, but anyway, occurs very often in John's gospel, 98 times. That's a lot of times. Compared with 11 in Matthew's gospels, 10 in Mark's gospel, and 9 in Luke's gospel. This is consistent with John's polemical and aggressively evangelistic purpose. Polemical is his argument. His argument is to say, you must believe, and drawing people to believe. So he's, he's getting people, trying to get them and poke them so they'll believe. That's what he says in John 20, 31, is the purpose of his book. His aim is to convert those who do not believe and to bring them to faith in Christ. So he keeps the issue of believing or refusing to believe squarely in the forefront. To believe or not to believe, that is the question for John. All right, that's kind of cute. Farley does a nice job with that. That's kind of cute, all right? That's come, some of you know that's Shakespeare, right? I mean, it's a, 
It's a, it's a, a you know, allusion, allusion to Shakespeare. Allusion to Shakespeare, Shakespeare. All right. Now, I put the bold emphasis here. So if you went to his commentary, this is not bold, but I put it in bold. The term believe is basic to John's gospel and describes the irreducible core of Christian commitment. It means to become Christ's follower, to acknowledge that one accepts his teaching, to become his disciple and identify oneself with other disciples. Did you realize it's the recognition not only to believe him as Christ, to follow him as Lord, and then to use, and to use our whole life to follow him, and to understand that we're therefore a member of every other believer who follows Jesus? You know, I've had some family members in the past that I was embarrassed that they were my family. Probably they were just as embarrassed about that I was their family. Uh, I, I remember thinking, and the Lord corrected me on that and saying, hey, you're family. You need to accept this and, and pray for them and realize you're family. You don't have to be embarrassed. By you just pray for them. They're not all perfect, and you're not all perfect. Do you know, I used to think that way a lot about the church. You know, I used to be very embarrassed. I used to be very uncomfortable with Catholic Christians. The Lord healed that pretty early. I don't know why. I think because I was trained by a Catholic deacon uh, when I was in college, at Wheaton College, I was working as an uh, assistant chaplain in a maximum security prison. This guy taught me so many things, and I still, I don't know that I, I would have said as a Baptist at that time, I think he's saved, but looking back, I am certain he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But uh, that really helped me a ton. And then I had some very good experiences with some nuns uh, that really helped me out. Once I had an experience with a nun who I believe was really an angel. Sometime I'll tell you that story, not this morning, but I'll tell you that story. It's quite a story, and I'm almost certain that an angel came to me in the form of, of a nun in a certain time when I was in New York City. I'll, I'll tell you that story some other time. But you know what part of the church embarrassed me the most? The charismatics and the Pentecost. I mean, if there was anybody, I didn't want to be associated. I don't want to be one of those weird people because I was so normal. I sort of just set the standard. This is what everyone should be like. And so when I saw the charismatic, I, oh my goodness, I was so embarrassed. I mean, they, they cry and they scream. Then, I, then, of course, I start crying and couldn't stop it. I remember as a Baptist, I started preaching, and, when, and it was the Holy Spirit coming on me, but I didn't know it. And I would cry. And Susie would be in the back, oh, dear Jesus, send the Holy Spirit and stop him crying. The more she prayed for the Holy Spirit, the more I cry. <laughs> Years later, our Pentecostal friend said, oh, that was the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, oh, she was praying the wrong thing. But, but anyway, I just thought, oh, they're, you know, they're the weirdos. They're the ones. They don't, they don't know anything. They're not smart. Of course, you find out later that's not true at all. But, but that was the caricature that I had. And I was embarrassed. And I can remember the Lord saying to me, are you going to love everyone that loves me? They're family. We got disagree. I don't agree with every Calvinist or Methodist or, or Presbyterian. I don't agree with everybody about everything. I don't agree with every Anglican. I'm kind of a difficult person, quite honestly. I got to, I, I've learned, I got my own opinions. But I have learned that my opinions do not make people born again or not. And I, got, I know people who disagree with me about exactly how everything is the pie is cut up of theology. But what I can see is the life of Jesus in them. And they're living Jesus for Jesus. They're loving Jesus. God is using them. And so what I've realized is God's got a really big margin of error on certain things. We can disagree about tongues. We can disagree about how to baptize. There's apparently a whole lot of things we can disagree about. And people can still love Jesus Christ and be in the family. And so I've learned to change the idea about where it is that we're in a family discussion versus those people who are outside the family. So I was raised that the only people in the family were the Baptists. Not all of them, but, but most of them. We were the Bapt and that was it. Everybody else wasn't really a Christian. Now I say all the people that love Jesus, if they love Jesus as Savior and Lord, uh, then they're in a the family. And whether I disagree with them or not, it uh, doesn't change. And, and there's many things to disagree with and to correct, but but we're family if we love Jesus. Part of what it means to follow Jesus is to understand that he gave our life, he gave his life for ours, and I must follow him every day. That's part of it. But also to recognize I have been repeopled in my baptism. You see, for Nicodemus, it was his birth that made all the difference. He was a son of Abraham. He, they believed, the Jews believed that all the Jews ultimately, Abraham would pull them, even if they were bad when they thought Abraham's going to grab them and get them into heaven. And they thought all the Gentiles, they're going to all end up getting, Abraham's going to say, you know, kind of body check them and, and they're not going to get in. So, you know, we have jokes that say like St. Peter's going to get you in. Well, the Jews would have thought Abraham was that guy. What's the Bible said? We will see him 
face to face and we'll be like him. Jesus is the one who's going to welcome us home, by the way. It won't be Peter. It will be Jesus. But in any case, uh, Nicodemus thought of all this thing with the first birth. And Jesus says, no, the repeopling of God, the true people of God will have been repeopled in their faith in Jesus, manifest and expressed in the sacrament of baptism and in the spirit baptism as they grow and mature in Christ. All right, and so that's part of what it means to fall is to understand that we have a new family. Uh, and it's called by Jesus' name. All right. So many modern evangelical Protestants, like me, use the term, have, have in the past used the term somewhat differently. For them to believe indeed means the psychological and volitional act. Volitional is the willful decision. The volitional act of placing one's trust in something. To believe describes, describes the moment of saving faith. And this mental act and commitment is to be radically distinguished from anything bodily that might accompany it, such as baptism. Now look, he's not saying that that's wrong. He's just saying it, there's more. Okay, There must be a willful, deliberate trusting and belief in Jesus. But he's saying it's the kind of belief that causes us to recognize Jesus is Lord. And if he's Lord, then we must follow him with all of our lives. And to be grown. Now, no one does that in the very beginning. We're all babies. And, but the point is that the true believer will persevere. They will, they will continue on and grow in the faith. When we see people who do not keep going, biblically, we don't have a reason to believe that they really are. Only Jesus knows. We're not condemning any judgment. Anyone, but, but the way that we're told that we'll know is that people start and finish well, growing, following Jesus, surrendering daily their life for his life, and being an expression of him and his will in all that they do. So, believing according to this teaching, the wrong teaching, the incomplete teaching, refers to the cerebral, the mental, the intellectual, and inner processes alone. It describes the moment of inner ascent. Again, that must happen. But the inner ascent must lead to a lifestyle of taking up our cross daily and following Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? He said, come and what? He didn't say, come and believe and, and get all your, your theology right. He said, come and follow me. Take up your cross daily, meaning die to your own agenda and follow me every day. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's the kind of faith that Jesus is expecting out of us. A faith that intellectually ascends and then with all of our bodily processes, follows and lives for Jesus every day. It is an error to read the reduced meaning, just the intellect, meaning into John's use of the term. For John, to believe in Jesus refers not to just to a moment of ascent or even to the fact of ascent. It refers to the qualities of one's life as a disciple. The believer is the one who continues on. Jesus said the one who continues on when he talked about the parable of the soils. Okay, some don't continue. They're not the real thing, Jesus said. This corporate, one may also say, one may also say ecclesial, church. This guy is clearly not Anglican. He's afraid to have a big doctrine on church. This corporate dimension of believing is never far. Excuse me. It means to live as one of Christ's followers and as a part of his church. It cannot be individual or individualistic. It's personal. It's not private. And it must have a corporate dimension or it's not legitimate. This corporate dimension of believing is never far from John's mind. Believing in Christ is almost synonymous with confessing him. And confessing Christ, like we do in the creed, is by definition corporate. We believe. Okay, We believe is the, the, the idea of the creed. Credo is we believe. The term, however, is somewhat elastic. It can describe one who follows Christ in sincerity and zeal, as well as those who follow him without truly committing themselves from the heart. So in John 20, 23, and John 8, 31, there are examples of people who believed in him but did not follow him. People who had an intellectual ascent but did not follow. And Jesus says they're not legit. That's what Jesus said. Just go read John 2, 21. That's what he says. The people believed in him because of the signs, but they didn't follow him. Okay? So it's possible to have an intellectual belief but not obey and not follow through. That's the wrong kind. That's what we don't want to have. Just as it is possible to confess Christ outwardly and be a part of the confessing group of disciples without having a deep and abiding loyalty to him within, so it is possible to believe and yet not truly be his dedicated disciple. 
This is why Christ challenges those who believe in him to continue in his teaching and not turn back. It becomes not simply a matter of believing, but also of remaining, of abiding, of possessing, staying power. When you hear the word endurance in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, staying power. It's like through persecution and trials, and we, we learn endurance, and that is translated, as he does there, staying power. We learn to, to hold on and to learn our faith grows. It is only as those who believe in him also continue in his word that they will be truly his disciples and will find true freedom. It is only as those who believe in him abide and remain in him that they will bear fruit. During Christ's ministry, there will be many who believed and heard him gladly. There were many who believed and heard him gladly. The challenge was to continue to believe and to persevere as one of his followers when all the others turned away. Do you get that? So there's a belief that gives itself to follow and that Christ has given his life for me. Therefore, I must give my life back to him. Okay, he died for me so I could live for him. That's the kind of belief. It's not one that just says, I have the right doctrine, now I'll go do my own thing. To Jesus, that's not the real faith. That's, not, that's, a, that's a belief, it's a faith, but it's not a saving faith. A saving faith, a true faith in Jesus, as he described, leads to people following him as Savior and Lord. All right? There's a correction, and that's, that's something that we were so afraid, and I've been so afraid to, to not give people the impression that we're saved by works, that I don't know that I've been as clear on that through the years as I wish I had been. Uh, let me say others, and I mentioned this before, but I love this Willard thing. Let me go back to it as we close. Dallas Willard said this, he's now dead, Southern Baptist, fantastic guy, but Willard said this, uh, and David sent this to me, I, I wouldn't have known Willard said this, but, but he said, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. So in the Bible, we cannot earn salvation. Works can never be seen as something that makes us good enough or prove ourselves back to God. Okay? But that does not suggest, grace does not suggest that we don't have many things we have to do to deny ourselves, to read his word, to pray, to worship. There are many efforts. There are many things that we plant by the power of the Holy Spirit in our reading, in our prayers, where we're doing our thing, but the Holy Spirit is blessing it and making it fruitful. All right? So we are many efforts of the Christian life. Okay? Grace encourages and makes our efforts fruitful. Okay? What grace is against is the idea and attitude of earning, of pride, of superiority, of self-righteousness. That is what grace uh, is antagonistic to, okay? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's the next thing Paul says? I always used to tell my students, the most overlooked verse in the Protestant Bible is verse 10. For we are, so grace you're saved by faith, not of yourself, right? So that's, that's the first thing. Not of works, let's say they mention boast. But then he says in verse 10, for we are his masterpieces, are his workmanship, created in Christ, new life in Christ, for the purpose of good works. Okay? We're expected that if we follow him, that we do follow him, that we live for him, we live obedient. When we fail, we repent. When we fail, we ask for more of the Spirit. We give ourselves to these things so that we're supposed to live and allow Jesus to live inside of us as we surrender to him every day. All right, two things I want to pray about this morning. So it's, it's a lot this morning, but it's Trinity Sunday, and I just had a couple of these things I wanted to hit. Um, but I want to go back now to two things. First one is for me, but maybe it's for you too. Just to make sure, if the Lord hit me so hard with it, I want to make sure that I don't miss it for you. And the first one is, have you been grumbling? I I've been grumbling. Have you been grumbling? There is no protection you may be doing spiritual warfare prayers. You may be doing all kinds of stuff. But if you're grumbling and complaining against God in the path he has you on, there is no protection from the fiery snakes if you're grumbling. Because that is to say, in essence, to, to remove yourself from grace and say, God is not doing for me what he's supposed to be doing. It's a very big deal. It, it brought them a death penalty. It doesn't bring us a death penalty, but it can open us up to many of the attacks of the enemy, many of the fire darts of the enemy through grumbling and complaining about the course that God has us on and about God's timing. I have been a little frustrated with his timing. 
I don't go around saying, Lord, I'm frustrated with your time. But, but I realize implicitly in some of the discouragement, I have not been checking and realizing that some of the discouragement about different things and the timing is taken is really in essence, is a type of internal complaint uh, against God and his ways and time. And I've had to really repent on that. Um, didn't see it like that. And, and we said, ah, but that's what's going on. And so I had to repent on that. So just in case that could be you, that's one thing. That's not the main flow of the sermon, but I say that because uh, Numbers 21 talks about that. Let me put that out there. Listen, maybe you're being attacked and can't figure out where the attack is coming. Maybe it's because the fiery darts are having access through our grumbling and complaining against God. That hinders the kind of protection that God would like to give us. That's the first thing. The second thing, how have you believed in Jesus? How have you believed? Has it been an intellectual thing? Or has it been, oh, I realize to follow Jesus as Savior Lord means that I've got to follow him. I've got to read the scriptures. I've got to be growing up. Meaning that, that, that it's he died and gave me life on the cross so that I would live his life in this world. Maybe some of us have had an immature idea. Maybe we were not taught properly about what it means to believe in Jesus. But it is not enough to simply say, I believe in Jesus and not, you know, Muhammad or something. It's not enough to have, it's got to be the kind of faith that constrains, that compels us to follow him day by day. Well, we understand that our agenda, our thoughts, our, that that must die and Jesus must live within us. If that's not the kind of faith you have, you might have missed saving faith. Or you just might have got off the track. I don't know which, but either way, guess what? What's the best remedy when you're not sure? I was in a law case. I was sued one time. Our church was sued one time. And someone said, we didn't do a vote right. And, and this, it was in a lawsuit. My, my, my lawyer said, he said, well, you know the simple thing to do? He wasn't a believer, so he said this to me. He said, he said well, do you have the votes? And I said, yeah, we got you know, 90% of the people agree. There's only a few people. He said, well, just vote again. Remove the impediment. If you're not sure the kind of way you believed in Jesus, remove the impediment. Give him your whole heart, your whole life. And whether you got it in the past or not, make sure that today you give him and you believe in him as saving Lord and then you follow through with that. And you commit yourself to living for him. You could spend five years one. am I saved or am I not saved? That'll get old in a hurry. Okay? The devil just beats you up about, just remove the impediment. Do you know how many times I asked Jesus to come to my heart. Thousands. I was never sure because when I sinned, I would say, oh, maybe I'm not a, I'd go to a sermon. I'd say, oh, maybe I'm not. I probably went forward 50 times. We don't really invite you to come forward, but, but I went forward in the Baptist church probably 50 times. Probably everyone in the church is like, thank God, maybe this one will work. <laughs> Remove the impediment day or night. If the enemy's attacking you at two in the morning, or you're not really a Christian. Remove the impediment. You will never be a problem if you come back to Jesus and you give him your whole heart once again. I mean, it only takes once. Okay? And I'm not sure which one worked, but I can tell you this. By now, I know it did work. But I cannot tell you for sure which one it was. But when I didn't know, I meant, Lord, I, I bang, bang, bang. I'm going to go back. I'm going to give him over and over again. Not because it needed more than once. It's just my conscience was accused. And so I had to come back. All right? And then finally, if you haven't been water baptized, move forward in obedience. Go through the catechism. We'll train you. Get baptized. Fall through in obedience in your water baptism. And if you've been water baptized and have missed the empowering ministry of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, make sure that you pursue that as well. It's crucial. It's crucial. You cannot be Christ's witnesses without Christ's spirit. Okay, yes, when you got saved... I love it this way. Different people say this, but it's such a good thing. I'm going to repeat it. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets you. Okay? So you got the Holy Spirit if you're born again. I have no doubt about that, personally. But the question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? We were on retreat this last week up in South Carolina. The Fellowship of Christ the Healer. Russ Parker was leading this thing. and It was so good because the whole thing of is all people who work in healing ministries... But it was all a chance for us to rest and to receive. And the last thing we did before we were commissioned to go back home was they prayed for each of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, fresh and new. And I can't tell you how wonderful that was. Peter was baptized in the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Three other times in the book of Acts, as years passed, he needed a fresh 
filling because at some level we leak. So have you been baptized? Have you been water? Have you been baptized in the spirit? And, and, and do you need a fresh infilling of that? If you seek the Lord, uh, this is the day he can be found. Uh, the worst thing would be is that we just sit there and sort of don't pursue. Okay, let's go for it. Let's give him all of our heart and all of our life. Lord Jesus, we come this morning. We thank you for your love. And Lord, we are so grateful for your salvation. And we do believe in you. We know who you are. We make the intellectual and psychological, volitional, willful choice. Yes, Lord, we choose you. We receive your forgiveness and your salvation. And we do so with the understanding that because you died for us, we are required to live for you every day, denying ourselves and taking up our cross every single day. Now, Lord, we pray. Would you pour out your spirit here in our church? Would you help us both individually and corporately to be more and more like Jesus? This is what you want, and this is what we want as well. So we pray for your help and your grace and your strength, and forgive us for all the grumbling, and me especially. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven.